Hi, I'm Alistair. I make escape room games. And in this video, I'd like to demonstrate this rising pedal stool prop I made. So inside there, there's a diamond, but you can't simply reach in and grab it as there is acrylic on all sides. Instead, what players need to do is to solve a puzzle. And when they do that, they trigger an electronic signal that causes the platform inside to rise up. When it reaches the top of the pedal stool, the item on that platform comes through the hole here and they can simply reach in and grab it. Now, there's lots of escape room scenarios you could imagine this being used in. This could be a high value artifact in a museum or an art gallery, or perhaps it is a chemical sample in a science lab. As Valentine's Day is approaching us, perhaps you could even use this as a contrived way of presenting your loved one with a romantic gift. In this video, I'm going to explain how I made it and also tell you how you can build one yourself. Now, when I was researching this project, I came across a couple of suppliers who were advertising similar products, but their designs just had a secret compartment inside the pedal stool that rose up containing an item. Now, from a game design point of view, I didn't find that very satisfying. I wanted players to be able to see the prize on the pedal stool, enticing them, but just inaccessible to them. So I needed to come up with a different type of mechanism. So first of all, I sketched a very rough design on a piece of paper of how I thought it might work. And then I coded that up in OpenSCAD. And here's what I came up with. So essentially there's two parts. There's the static part colored in yellow, and that consists of the base plinth, these four side columns and the top panel, which has got a hole cut in it. And then there's the moving section, which has a base platform here. It's got a top panel and these are connected by four rods that pass through holes in the top of the fixed section. Now, to explain how this works, let me now set it to animate. And you'll see the platform rising up and down. So the idea is that when the moving platform is at its lowest point, the base plate here sits on top of the pedal stool and the top plate lies flush on top of the top of the fixed section. And that covers over the hole at the top. Remember I mentioned that the side panels here have all got transparent acrylic plates in them as well. So when the moving section is at the bottom, players can't reach in through the sides and they can't reach through the top either. As it moves up to the top, what happens is that the item which you would place on side this little flat cylinder here gets lifted up and when it reaches the top, it sticks out through the hole in the top of the fixed section Players can then reach in from the side and grab it. So that's the basic design. Now let me show you some aspects of the physical build in a bit more detail. So the panels are made from 18mm MDF board and the side uprights here are pine. The unit itself is pretty heavy, but just like most other things in an escape room, you'd probably want to bolt it to the floor to make sure that players don't knock it over. The rods here that connect the top and bottom platforms of the moving section, these are 8mm steel rods and they pass through bearings which I've inserted into the top of the fixed section here. These are LM8UU bearings and I've secured them with these little 3D printed caps which I've inserted into the underside there. They just hold the bearings in place in the top panel. To give the unit a bit of a decorative finish, I painted it uh, with this textured spray paint here, and that's what gives it this kind of overall stone effect, which I kind of quite like. Now, in terms of the mechanism that's going to cause the moving section to rise up, I considered a couple of different options. I could have used a motorized scissor lift or a threaded screwdrive or even a gas strut, but instead I went for a linear actuator. And if I open up this section of the plinth at the base, you'll be able to see there it is. 
Now, if you're not familiar with linear actuators, they're essentially electronically operated motors, but rather than spinning round and round, they have a shaft that extends up and down. So this is a 12 volt linear actuator. There's some details there on the side. And if I supply 12 volt DC across its two wires, the shaft here extends and it pushes the platform up to the top. And one of the nice things about linear actuators is that they have built-in limit switches. So when it reaches the top here, it will automatically cut off. Uh, you'll notice that I uh, actually placed the base of the actuator here on a moving shelf. I had to move this up and down a few times so that when it was fully extended, the top section of the rising platform here just pokes up above the surface. Um, so I'm using a 300 millimeter extension actuator so the distance here that it extends is 300 millimeters if you supply dc current with the reverse polarity so you swap the wires around essentially it causes the actuator to contract again and when it reaches the base just as before it will automatically shut off so you can get actuators with different stroke lengths that's how much it extends as well as different speeds and different amounts of lifting force. And you could adjust the dimensions of your pedal stool to adapt to different sort of actuators. And to make it extend and contract, you need to supply 12 volts in this case, which what most actuators are. And to do that, you'd normally use a relay, but a relay would simply turn 12 volts on or off. We need to be able to specify the polarity of that 12 volts to be able to apply 12 volts with current flowing in one direction to make it extend and then to flip it to make it contract again. And to do that, we need two relay channels. So let me show you a little bit more about the electronics, which is what's contained in this box at the bottom. So that box is a controller I bought off AliExpress made by a company called Kinkoni. And all this is, it's a board that has an ESP32 chip together with a bunch of other components. It's got an IR receiver, some buttons, a buzzer, and crucially, four relay channels. And it's actually quite a neat little board that you could use for quite a lot of escape room controllers. It's got a USB socket here, so you can program it from the Arduino IDE, just as you would any other controller. But you can also build the same functionality yourself using an Arduino, Raspberry Pi, ESP8266 or pretty much any other microcontroller by just combining them with a two channel relay module. And here's how you'd wire it up if you wanted to use an Arduino instead. So I've got my linear actuator at the top, here I've got a dual channel relay module and then I've got an Arduino Nano at the bottom. Now if we just start off by looking how the Arduino is wired to the relays, we've got 5 volt and ground connected to VCC and ground here, and then we've got two signal lines which are connected to GPIO pins 2 and 3. And when the Arduino writes a high or a low signal to these two pins, what this does is it causes the corresponding relay coils to energize, and internally that causes the common pin in the center of each relay module to flick between uh, the normally closed side and the normally open side. So we've got two channels, this one corresponds to this relay module and this channel corresponds to this relay module. Now if we look at the way that we've got it wired on the load side of the relay, here I've got my linear actuator. You see it's got two wires coming off it and normally I'm quite particular about the way I color code wires in my diagram so that black is always ground and red is a positive DC voltage. But you'll notice that here I've very deliberately chosen to use white and grey wires instead because we're going to be changing the relative voltage supplied across each of these contacts and that's what's going to cause the actuator to either contract or extend. Now the way we do that, we've got a 12 volt DC power supply here. You can see we've got the negative terminal of it connected to both of the normally closed contacts. And we've got the positive terminal, so plus 12 volts, going to both of the normally 
open contacts. And then we've taken the two wires that go to the linear actuator to the common pin of both relays. So now let's imagine that the Arduino here has written a low signal to both pins D2 and, B th and D3. Sorry. So in that case, both of the relays are in the same state. They're both in the normally closed position. So in that case, the grey wire here is connected to this black wire. The white wire is connected to this black wire as well. So the two terminals of the linear actuator, there is no potential difference between them and no current is going to flow because they're both connected to exactly the same negative terminal. Nothing is connected to the positive terminal. If we write a high signal to both pins 2 and 3 on the GPIO pins, what's going to happen is that both relay modules are going to activate. The common terminal here, instead of being connected to the normally closed pin, is going to be connected to the normally open pin instead, and the same on this side. So now we've got both of the contacts on the linear actuator are connected through to the red wire to 12 volts. But because they're both at the same potential, once again, there's not going to be any current flow between them. So if both pins are high or if both pins are low, nothing's going to happen. The only situation where current is going to flow and cause the actuator to do something is if we write a low signal to one of the pins and a high signal to the other. So in that case, let's say we send a low to this relay. This is connected to normally closed, which is the black line, and a high to this relay module. Well, now we're connected to the red, so positive 12 volts on this side. So we've got plus 12 volts here, and we've got zero here, so we've got current flowing in one direction. And then if we switch the uh, two signals that we're writing, so we write high on this side and low on this side instead, now we've got 12 volts here and zero here. So we're now going to cause current to flow in the other direction instead. And that's what's going to make the actuator either contract or extend. And here's an example sketch that you could have running on the controller. Now, obviously, you need to determine the trigger that's actually going to cause the linear actuator to extend and contract. In this example here, I've simply attached two buttons to two GPIO inputs on the controller. I'm using 27 and 14. But you could have this be a keypad that players have to enter the correct code or be triggered by an RFID sensor or a magnet sensor or any other input you want. The main thing I'm concerned about in this code is controlling the output to the two relay channels which are attached to these GPIO pins. Now what I'm doing here is I'm actually making use of a library called Button2 which I haven't used before. I used to use a library called Bounce2 for debouncing button input. I've recently moved to using Button2 instead which is very similar but it actually makes use of callbacks to trigger actions when buttons have been pressed. So I'll demonstrate how that's used. So in the terms of controlling the output I've got my three functions defined here. I've got rise, fall and stop. Uh, I could also have called these extend or contract or whatever but essentially this one turns the relay channels in opposite directions. So this one makes channel 0 high and channel 1 low and this one makes channel 0 low and channel 1 high and this one sets them both to be the same low. So as I just demonstrated in the wiring diagram this is going to supply 12 volt voltage in one direction. This is going to make current flow in the other direction. And this is going to cause no current flow through the actuator at all and cause it to stop. Now in terms of when those functions are actually called, I'm going to call them in my callback function for my buttons. So I've defined a function called onPress and I will attach that in the setup function in a moment. But what's quite interesting, the way that this library is set up, this button2 library, is that you can actually assign the same callback handler 
to every button. So you could have, I've got two buttons here, but you can have five buttons, 16 buttons. And then in the callback, you differentiate between which one was pressed by comparing this parameter here that's passed into the callback function to your declared buttons. So I had my array at the top here, which I declared input buttons, and it's got two elements in it. And my two elements are attached to uh, my two digital input pins. And then when one of them is pressed, what's going to happen is I'm going to enter this callback function here. I'm going to see which one of them was pressed and either then call the rise function or the fall function. I, if I wanted to, when a button was released, I could call the stop function instead. And you can add many different other event handlers. So one of the nice things about this button 2 library is that as well as handling the debouncing of mechanical inputs, it also has things like double press, triple press, long presses, releases and holds and things like that defined. So rather than it just being a simple button input, you can actually define more and more of these callback functions for more advanced inputs. So I'm only really using very basic functionality here and I could have done this using a, just a simple digital read of the input button bin to be honest but I thought I'd demonstrate it uh, just because it's a library that I'm now making use of and I thought you might be interested in as well. So in the setup function we initialize the relay outputs we just say that they're going to be outputs so we can write those digital high and low signals to them here. We define the digital input pins as inputs and we call the begin method on each of our button objects to attach them to those pins. And then we assign this pressed handler, the on press, here. And this is going to be called for any button that is pressed. This function will be called and will take the corresponding action. And like I mentioned, it's worth looking into uh, this library here. I've included a link in the code. It's worth looking into because there's much more functionality that you can actually do with two buttons anyway. But what this does mean is because it's a callback based model, when we get to loop, we actually have surprisingly little to do. We don't need to call digital read. We don't need to even explicit read the buttons. What we do is we call the loop function on each of the buttons and they are kind of self contained objects that will be responsible for checking themselves whether their pressed handler needs to be called. Um, so it makes your code kind of quite neat and tidy I find using this callback based model. So that's all it does. But like I say this is really just an example. In practice you probably simply wouldn't want a button to be pressed to cause the actuator to rise or fall anyway. But you could incorporate this logic here in pretty much any of the other escape room puzzle code that I've demonstrated on this channel. So I've demonstrated all kinds of sensors, hall sensors, read sensors, light sensors, color sensors, RFID sensors, any of those inputs at all, you could call this rise, fall or stop function if the outcome is what you want them to be when the puzzle is solved and that is going to cause the actuator to rise. Because it has that limit switch built in at either end, you don't need to do any further tests as to whether the platform has risen all the way to the top or the bottom. You just call this once and it's kind of fire and forget. So it actually makes the code really quite straightforward. That's all there is to it. So that about brings me to the end of this video. It's been a little bit different from my normal style because it's been much more focused on the hardware side of things rather than the software. But hopefully it's still given you some ideas and inspirations for new puzzles and props that you can put in your escape rooms. And as always, there's loads of different ways that you could style this basic design to incorporate all sorts of thematic elements, whether it be sci-fi or bank heist or, or any story that you want to tell. As always, I want to say thank you so much to all my Patreon supporters who enable me to create these tutorial videos each month. I do really value your support, so thank you all so much. If you have any other questions that I forgot to cover in this video about any part of the design or build of this, please do write them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them. 
Uh, other than that, please do subscribe to this channel if you'd like to see more tutorial videos for escape room ideas in the future. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers. Bye.